Manifesto for the Abolition of Enslavement to Interest on Money by Gottfried Fetter, Engineer Translated by Scott Hadding Mammonism is the heavy, all-encompassing, and overwhelming sickness from which our contemporary cultural sphere, and indeed all mankind, suffers. It is like a devastating illness, like a devious poison that has gripped the peoples of the world. By mammonism is to be understood, on the one hand, the overwhelming international money powers, the supra-government financial power enthroned above any right of self-determination of peoples, international big capital, the purely gold international. On the other hand, a mindset that has taken hold of the broadest circle of peoples, the insatiable lust for gain, the purely worldly-oriented conception of life that has already led to a frightening decline of all moral concepts and can only lead to more. The mindset is embodied and reaches its acme in international plutocracy. The chief source of power for mammonism is the effortless and endless income that is produced through interest. From the thoroughly immoral idea of interest on loans, the Gold International was born. The mental and moral constitution, grown from the lust for interest and profiteering of every kind, has led to the frightening corruption of a part of the bourgeoisie. The idea of interest on loans is the diabolical invention of big loan capital. It alone makes possible the lazy drone's life of a minority of tycoons at the expense of the productive peoples and their work potential. It has led to profound irreconcilable differences, to class hatred from which war among citizens and brothers was born. The only cure, the radical means to heal suffering humanity, is the abolition of enslavement to interest on money. The abolition of enslavement to interest on money signifies the only possible and conclusive liberation of productive labor from the hidden, coercive money powers. The abolition of enslavement to interest signifies the restoration of the free personality, the redemption of man from slavery, from the curse whereby mammonism has bound his soul. Whoever wishes to fight capitalism must abolish enslavement to interest. Where must the abolition of enslavement to interest begin? With loan capital. Why? Because loan capital, compared to all industrial big capital, is so overpowering that the great money powers can only be fought effectively through the abolition of interest slavery. Twenty to one is the proportion of loan capital to industrial big capital. The German people must annually raise more than 12 billion in interest for loan capital in the form of direct and indirect taxes, rent, and the rising cost of living. While even in the boom years of the war, the sum total of all dividends distributed by the German joint stock companies amounted to only one billion. The avalanche-like growth of loan capital surpasses all human capacity for calculation through eternal, endless, and effortless income from interest and from interest on interest. What blessing does the abolition of enslavement to interest bring for the laboring folk of Germany, for the proletarians of all countries of the earth? The abolition of Enslavement to interest gives us the possibility of purchasing the repeal of all direct and indirect taxes. Hear this, if you value producing men of all lands, all states and continents, all state revenues flowing from direct and indirect sources, pour constantly into the pockets of big loan capital. The profit of state-owned businesses, including the Postal Service, Telegraph, Telephone, Radio, Mines, Forests, and so on, suffice entirely for the funding of all essential state commitments for schools, universities, courts, administrative agencies, and social welfare. Thus, no true socialism will bring any blessing to humanity as long as the profits from public enterprises remain 
tributary to big loan capital. Therefore, we demand as a fundamental law of the state, first for the German peoples, then as a fundamental law for all those kindred peoples that wish to enter with us into the cultural community of a league of nations, the following. First, war bonds, along with all other debt instruments of the German Reich, along with all other debt instruments of the German federal states, especially railroad bonds, as well as debenture bonds of all local governments, are declared under cancellation of the obligation for interest, to be legal tender for the face value, or rather are to be converted into bank credit. Second, with all other fixed interest papers, converted bonds, industrial bonds, mortgages, and so forth, the obligation for interest is replaced by the obligation to pay the principal. Thus, after twenty or twenty-five years, depending upon the interest rate, the lent capital is repaid and the debt retired. Third, all real estate debts, mortgages, and so forth are to be paid off on installments of the same amount as the payments required hitherto, in keeping with the charges recorded in the land register. The property in houses and land, freed from debt in this manner, becomes partly the property of the state or of the local government. In this way the state becomes better situated to control and to lower rents. Fourth, the entire monetary system should be under the state's central bank. All private banks likewise, postal check banks, savings banks, and credit unions, all become affiliated as branch operations. Fifth, all credit for real estate is awarded only through the state's bank. Personal credit and commercial credit are mandated to private bankers under a concession from the state. This concession is granted based on consideration of need, with a ban on the establishment of branches for certain districts. The scale of charges is fixed by the state. Sixth, equity securities are paid off in the same manner as fixed interest papers at the annual rate of 5%. Excess profits are paid out in part to the stockholders as compensation for risked capital, in contrast to fixed interest and coin-backed papers, while the remaining surplus by the sovereign right of labor is either socially distributed or applied for reduction of the prices of products. Seventh, for all persons who for physical reasons, advanced age, illness, physical or mental work disability, extreme youth, are not in a position to earn their livelihood, the interest incomes from present capital assets continue to be paid as a pension at the same and eventually even increased levels in return for delivery of securities. Eighth, in the interest of a reduction of the current inflation of paper money, a universal, strongly graduated tax on war bond certificates and other debt instruments of the Reich and of states is enacted. These papers are to be pulped. Ninth, through intensive enlightenment of the people, it is to be made clear to the people that money is and should be nothing other than a voucher for completed labor, that while every highly developed economy of course has need of money as a medium of exchange, the function of money also ends with that, and in no case should money be lent a super-mundane power to grow of itself by means of interest at the expense of productive labor. Why have we not already done all this, which is so self-evident, which must be regarded as the egg of Columbus for the social question? Because in our mammonistic blindness we have on learned how to see clearly that the doctrine of the sanctity of interest is a monstrous self-deception that the gospel of the lone interest that alone makes one blessed has entangled our entire thinking in the golden web of international plutocracy, because we have forgotten and are deliberately kept in confusion by the omnipotent money powers about the fact that except in the case of a few rich people, the interest that seems so lovely, 
and is so beloved of the thoughtless, is completely offset by taxes. All of our tax legislation is and remains, so long as we do not have liberation from enslavement to interest, only a tribute obligation to big capital, and not, as we would imagine, a voluntary sacrifice for the accomplishment of labor for the community. Therefore, liberation from enslavement to interest on money is the clear motto for the global revolution, for the liberation of productive labor from the chains of the supra-governmental money powers. Implementation and Rationale We stand in the midst of one of the most grievous crises that our impoverished folk has had to endure in its painful history. Seriously ill is our folk, seriously ill is the entire world. Helplessly the nations stammer. A passionate longing, a cry for redemption, passes through the gloomy masses. With laughter and dancing, with cinema and pageantry, the folk seeks to forget its own lamentable destiny, to forget about its disillusioned hopes, about the deep inner pain, about the terrible disappointment over what one so gladly called the gains of the revolution. But how did we imagine it all differently? How did all the fine promises run differently? All that we have hoped to gain in the dark of night, in the darkness of our military collapse, seems to be glistening gold. But now, when the gray day illuminates the find, it is all rotten bits of wood. Now we stand here at a loss, for the sake of these rotten bits of wood that shone so finely in the night, we have thrown away everything that hitherto was dear and valuable to us, and have stuffed all our pockets with this lamentable trove. No wonder that the rage of despair grips precisely the poorest of the poor, and that they rage in senseless wrath against their own brothers." and in their deep longing for redemption seek to destroy all that stands in the way. This condition must lead to utter madness. If conscienceless and stupidity goad the people further. And whither this madness leads, we see in the Bolshevik Revolution. Nationalization, as socialization is called in Russia, has proved to be a failure declares an unperturbed Lenin. The economy is destroyed, the buying power of money down to nothing, the intelligentsia killed, the laborers without bread, despair in the entire people. Only bloody terror, based on Chinese and Latvian mercenaries, is able to protect the Russian dictators from the vengeance of the betrayed folk. Among us, too, the development will follow this course if international speculators, obsessed party fanatics, representatives of the most grievously burdened bourgeoisie, and members of a race most deeply alien in nature to the German folk, continue to be allowed in the government. What indeed were those pretty, pretty words that one whispered into our ear? Negotiated peace, League of Nations, parliamentarianism, sovereignty of the people, democracy, dictatorship of the proletariat, socialism, destruction of capitalism, liberation from militarism, and other such pretty slogans. A new free people was supposed to arise, which should determine its own destiny. None of any of that has come true was able to come true, or ever could come true, if we do not with the highest moral seriousness investigate all these apparitions, all these slogans, if we do not conscientiously test the symptoms of the illness like an intelligent concerned physician and painstakingly diagnose the present condition of the sick person, sparing no effort to ascertain whence this serious critical illness arises. The sickness of our age is called mammonism, 
What is mammonism? Mammonism is the sinister, invisible, mysterious reign of the great international money powers. Mammonism is, however, also a mindset. It is the worship of these money powers on the part of all those who are infected with mammonistic poison. Mammonism is the unlimited hypertrophy of the, in itself healthy, human drive for acquisition. Mammonism is the lust for money grown into a madness, which knows no higher goal than to pile money on top of money, which seeks with unequaled brutality to coerce all forces of the world into its service, and must lead to the economic enslavement, to the exploitation of the work potential of all peoples of the world. Mammonism is the mindset that has led to a decline of all moral concepts. Mammonism considered as a worldwide phenomenon is to be equated with brutal, ruthless egoism in man. Mammonism is the spirit of greed, of boundless desire for to rule, of the mentality entirely focused on seizing the goods and treasures of the world. It is, at its core, the religion of the purely worldly-oriented human type. Mammonism is the direct opposite of socialism. Socialism, conceived as the highest moral idea, as the idea that man is not in the world only for himself alone, that every man has duties toward the community, toward all humanity, and that he is not only responsible for the momentary well-being of his family, of the members of his tribe, of his folk, but that he also has unshakable moral obligations toward the future of his children and his folk. More concretely, we must see mammonism as the conscious collusion of the power-hungry big capitalists of all peoples. Noteworthy in this has always been the hidden arrival of mammonism. The big tycoons lurk indeed as the ultimate driving force behind world-encompassing Anglo-American imperialism. Nothing else. The great money powers indeed financed the terrifying mass homicides of the World War. The great money powers have indeed, as owners of all great newspapers, woven the world into a web of lies. They have, with satisfaction, whipped up all lower passions, have diligently fostered the growth of present tendencies, and have, through clever press propaganda, brought French revanchism to a boil. They carefully nurtured the pan-Slavic idea, the Serbian conceit of being a great power, and the need of these states for money, to the point that the world conflagration must ignite. Even among us in Germany, the spirit of mammonism that wanted to know only more export figures, national wealth, expansion, big bank projects, and international finance deals, led to a rout of public morality, to the decline of our ruling circle into materialism and hedonism, to a superficiality in our national life, all factors that share blame for the terrifying collapse. With astonishment, we must ask ourselves whence Mormonism, whence international big capital derives its irresistible power. It is not to be overlooked that the international collaboration of the great money powers represents a completely new phenomenon. We have no parallel for this in history. International obligations of a monetary nature were practically unknown. Only with the rising global economy the general global commerce did the idea of international interest economy establish itself and here we touch the deepest root here we have hit upon the innermost source of strength from which the golden international draws its irresistible power interest the effortless and endless influx of goods based on the mere ownership of money without any addition of labor has caused the great money powers to grow. Loan interest is the diabolical principle from which the gold internationally was born. Loan capital has firmly attached its blood funnel absolutely everywhere. 
like the arms of the anemone, big loan capital is ensna has ensnared all states, all peoples of the world. Government loans, government bonds, railroad bonds, war bonds, mortgages, covered bond obligations, in short, loan instruments of every kind, have in a manner ensnared the entire economic life so that henceforth all the peoples of the world wriggle helplessly in the golden webs for the sake of the interest principle, in keeping with a thoroughly mad political delusion that every kind of possession carries an entitlement to earnings, we have submitted to enslavement, to interest on money. Not a single real valid moral reason can be given as to why mere possession of money should bring an entitlement to perpetual interest payments. This inner opposition to interest and to income of every kind without any occurrence of productive labor extends through the sole life of all peoples and times. But never has this deep inner resistance to the power of money become so conscious for the nation as in our time. Never has mammonism been prepared in such a world-encompassing manner to begin world domination. Never has it placed in its service all baseness, lust for power, lust for revenge, greed, envy, and falsehood in such a cleverly concealed and yet brutally pushy manner as now. The world war is at its inmost core one of the biggest decisions in the evolutionary process of humanity and the struggle to decide whether in the future the mammonistic materialistic worldview or the socialistic aristocratic worldview should determine the fate of the world. On the surface, the mammonistic Anglo-American coalition has without doubt been initially victorious. As a reaction against it, Bolshevism arose in the East, and if one wishes to see a great idea in Bolshevism, it is without doubt the position diametrically opposed to the uh, mammonistic worldview. The methods that Bolshevism seeks to employ for this, however, are the botched cures of a Dr. Eisenbarth. They are the attempt to help someone sick from internal poisoning with a scalpel by amputating his head, arm, and legs. Against this rampage of Bolshevi Bol Bolshevism, against this senseless overturning, we must present a workable new idea that with unifying force unites all laboring classes so as to drive out the poison that has made the world sick. I see this means in the abolition of enslavement to interest on money. There are three factors that make interest on loan capital conspicuous as the authentic and true cause of our financial misery. First, the monstrous disproportion of fixed interest loan capital, thus of capital that grows of its own accord without application of creative labor, and indeed grows on forever. Among us in Germany, this loan capital has already reached a level that we do not consider too high at 250 billion. In contrast to this enormous sum, the American working capital of our entire German industry stands only at 11.8 billion. In addition, there is the 3.5 billion in capital of the 16,000 industrial limited liability companies, so that altogether we have only about 15 billion in industrial capital to tabulate. 20 to 1 is the first fundamental finding. This appraisal means that in financial problems of the largest importance, all measures concerned with loan capital must prove 20 times as effective as measures directed at industrial big capital. This number was on the average of about 600 million. In the last two years of the war, 1914, 1918, it may very well have gone up considerably, but will record an all the greater crash for the current year, 1919. The average profitability of all German stock corporations was 8.21%, thus only about three-quarter percent higher 
than the average return on fixed interest loan values. Thus I recapitulate. In the future, the German people will have to pay about $12.5 billion annually for the various eternal interest charges of big loan capital, while the yield from industrial capital in the greatest boom year was $1 billion. And in times of undisturbed prosperity, only $0.6 billion. Thus we see again here the proportion on the orders of magnitude of 20 to 1 to 12 to 1. The third and most dangerous factor is the enormous growth beyond comprehension of big loan capital through interest and through interest on interest. I must here digress a bit more and hope through a small excursion into higher mathematics to explain the problem. First, some examples. The charming story of the invention of the game of chess is well known. The rich Indian king, Shiram, granted to the inventor, as thanks for the invention of the royal game, the fulfillment of a wish. The, wi the wish of the wise man was that the king should give him one grain of wheat on the first square of the chess game, two on the second, four on the third, and thus always on each square twice as many as on the one before. The king smiled at the seemingly modest wish of the wise man and ordered that a sack of wheat be brought so that for every square the grains of wheat could be apportioned. As we all know, the fulfillment of this wish was impossible, even for the richest prince in the world. All the world's harvests in a thousand years would not suffice to fill the 64 squares of the checkboard. One more example. Many will still remember from the, the other school days the torture of calculating compound interest. How the penny invested at the time of the birth of Christ multiplies at compound interest so that it doubles every 15 years. In the Year 15, after the birth of Christ, the penny has grown to two pennies. In the year 30 A.D. to four pennies. In the year 45 A.D. to eight pennies, and so on. Very few will remember what value this penny would represent today. The volume of gold equivalent to the volume of the earth. The sun and all the planets combined would not be adequate to represent the value of this penny invested at compound interest. A third example, the fortune of the House of Rothschild, the oldest international plutocracy, is valued today at about 40 billion. It is well known that in Frankfurt around the year 1800, old Mayor Amichel Roth Rothschild, without wealth of his own, worth mentioning, laid the foundation for the gigantic fortune of his house through fractional reserve lending of the millions that Count Wilhelm of Hesse had entrusted to him for safekeeping. Had the accretion of money through interest and interest on interest with Rothschild succeeded only at the modest rate of the penny, the curve would not have climbed so deeply as it has, steeply as it has, but assuming that the Rothschild's collective wealth increased only at the rate of the penny, the Rothschild's fortune in the year 1935 would be 80 billion. In 1950, 160 billion. In 1965, 320 billion. And with that, it would already exceed by far the total German national wealth. From these three examples, a mathematical law can be derived. The curve that represents the rise of the Rothschild fortune, the curve that can be derived from the number of wheat grains for the chessboard and for the number that the multiplication of the penny produces at compound interests, are simple mathematical curves. All of these curves have the same character. After initially modest and gradual increase, the curve becomes ever steeper and soon practically approaches being almost tangential to infinity. 
although differently, however, altogether differently, however, does the growth curve of industrial capital proceed. Likewise sprung mostly from small beginnings, soon a strong escalation of the curves appears until a certain saturation of capital is reached. Then the curves run flatter, and in a certain industries will perhaps even decline slightly. If new inventions have led to the devaluation of existing factories, machines, and so on, I would like to select only one example here, the development of the Krupp works. In 1826, old man Krupp died almost without assets. In 1855, Alfred Krupp received his first order for 36 cannons on behalf of the Egyptian government. In 1873, Krupp already employed 12,000 workers. In 1903, Frau Berta Krupp sold the entire works and property to the Alfred Krupp Joint Stock Company for $160 million. Today, the total value of the stock capital amounts to $250 million. What does the name Krupp connote for, US, for us Germans? The acme of our industrial development, the world's first maker of steel cannons, a vast sum of the most tenacious, purposeful, intensive productivity. For hundreds of thousands of our folk comrades, the Krupp endeavor has meant bread and work. For our nation, weapons and defense. And yet it is a dwarf compared to the Rothschild billions. What significance does the growth of the Krupp fortune during the century have compared to the growth of the Rothschild fortune through effortless and endless accretion from interest and interest on interest? The two curves drawn in bold lines represent loan interest, and indeed the upper curve shows the development of the Rothschild fortune, and the lower curve, at first flat, then rapidly rising, shows a very, in a very general way the characteristic development of all such curves, in which a small advance on the horizontal axis can produce a doubling of the value on the vertical axis. The hatched line shows the development curve of our total industry in the course of the last 40 to 50 years. The differently hatched fine lines show the development of several randomly selected big industrial enterprises from which the general character of the hatched curve of industrial capital is derived. It must be expressly remarked that the curves of loan capital are shown strongly compressed Thus, for example, the curve of the Rothschild fortune must be set 80 times so high as the Krupp curve. The purpose of showing the curves, of course, is only to demonstrate the fundamentally different character of the two types of capital. The curves of loan capital show at first a quite gradually rising development. The development then goes faster until even wilder and and dragging everything with it, it raises itself far beyond human concepts and strives toward infinity. The curve of industrial capital, by contrast, remains in the finite. However strong the divergence that a trace may show in detail, overall the fundamental character of industrial development will always be such that after strong initial development, a certain period of maturity, of saturation, follows after which, sooner or later, the, de the decline ensues. Nothing shows us more clearly the deep, essential difference between loan capital and industrial capital. Nothing can make the difference clearer for us between the devastating effects of loan capital and the business profits, dividends of business capital put up and risked in large industrial enterprises than this comparison. It cannot be emphasized enough that the recognition of the mathematical laws that loan capital and industrial capital follow alone shows us the clear path where the lever is to be applied for setting aright our wrecked financial finance economy. We recognize clearly
that not the capitalistic economic order, not capital in itself as such, is the scourge of humanity. The insatiable interest need of big loan capital is the curse of all laboring humanity. Capital must be, labor must be, labor alone can do little, capital alone can do nothing. Capital without labor can only be sterile. Therefore the most important demand, the most noble task of the revolution, the most sensible meaning of a world revolution, is the abolition of enslavement to interest money. The House of Rothschild today is valued at forty billion. The billionaires of American high finance, Masters, Kahn, Loeb, Schiff, Spire, Morgan, Vanderbilt, and Astor are valued together at sixty to seventy billion at the least. At an interest rate of only five percent, this means an income for these eight families of five to six billion, which according to the researches of Carl Helferich is roughly 75% of the annual income that all taxpayers in Prussia had in the year 1912. There were at that time around 21 million taxpayers. 75% of that would be about 15 million. For every taxpayer, there are, on the average, 1.56 relatives, hence 23 million relatives. Around 38 million Germans thus have had to live on what the aforementioned billionaires have as a yearly income. Certainly the American billionaires are not pure loan capitalists in the same sense as the House of Rothschilds and so on. I do not care at all to argue about whether the American billionaires are really $100 million millionaires or $1,000 million mark billionaires. In the former case, one would just have to reckon in one or two dozen additional cro crosses. Or let us simply accept Rathenau's 300. Then our inventory will certainly be in order. Here it is not important to give an exact number, but the acknowledged ratio of 300 to 38 million opens our eyes about the brutal reign of international loan capital. Therefore, let us cast off these terrible chains that can only strangle all energetic labor. Let us tear away from money the power to bear interest and ever again to bear interest until all humanity has become entirely obligated for interest to international loan capital. Thus it is these three points that make clear to us for the first time where alone the lever may be effectively applied for the alleviation of our international financial distress. For another thing, we recognize that the assault of the entire socialist world of ideas against industrial capital has been completely off the mark, because even as an intended complete regulation of socialization of the entrepreneurial profit, assuming an unweakened economy, would yield a laughably meager sum compared to the enormous financial burdens of the budgets of our Reich and our state. Through the abolition of enslavement to interest on money, the entire financial malaise can be eliminated with one blow. At once we feel solid ground under our feet again. At once it must and will become clear to us that we have only deceived ourselves in the most grotesque manner with this wretched bond economy. For what else is loan capital but debts? Loan capital is debts. One cannot repeat that often enough. What form of madness is it when the German people in its totality have borrowed $150 billion for its war? When it has even promised itself for this a quantity of, I, I can't make this out, it's 7 slash 4, maybe it means 7.4 billion in interest, and now feels itself shifted into the awkward situation, inevitable from the start, of trying to collect this from, uh, something billion from itself in the form of entirely fanciful taxes. The tragic thing about this self-deception, meanwhile, is less the stupidity of this whole war, war bond economy 
of which we have always made so much better use than the rest of the world, than the fact that only a relatively small number of big capitalists derives enormous benefit from it, while the entire laboring folk, including the medium-sized and smaller capitalists, as well as the business, trade, and industry, must pay the interest. And here the political side of the whole idea comes to light. Here they can recognize that, in fact, big loan capital, and only this, that is not the industrial capital, is the curse of all laboring humanity. One may twist and turn the thing as one wishes, but always the mass of all hard-working people must in the end bear the cost of interest payments on loan capital. The middle-sized and smaller capitalists have nothing to show for their lovely interest payments, can have nothing to show for the sums of interest must be entirely taxed away, whether in the form of direct taxes or indirectly in the way of indirect taxes, stamps, tariffs, or other burdens on commerce. The hard-working folk is always the sucker and big capital the beneficiary. It is now quite astonishing to see how the socialist idea world of Marx and Engels from the Communist Manifesto to the Erfurt program, especially Kotsky, and even the current socialist leaders spare the interest of loan capital as if on command. The sanctity of interest is taboo. Interest is the holy of holies. No one has yet dared to call it into question. While property, nobility, security of person and possessions, the laws of the crown, privileges and religious conviction, honor of officers, fatherland and freedom are more or less outlawed, interest is holy and unassailable. Confiscation of wealth and socialization, thus outright violations of the law that are only somewhat sugar-coated insofar as they are committed ostensibly in the name of the totality of individuals, are the order of the day. All of that is permitted, but interest is the noli me tangere, the touch me not. The interest payment on the Reichs debt is the alpha and omega of the state budget. Its gigantic weight drags the ship of state into the abyss, and yet it is all a big swindle, a monstrous self-deception, fostered only and solely for the benefit of the great money powers. Here I would like to touch briefly now upon the objections relating to small pensioners to be discussed later so that one does not get hung up thinking about them. In the consideration of the very big questions, these are not considered, but it goes without saying that these compensations will be provided through the broadest expansion of self social welfare services. Swindle, I said, interest swindle, a strong word, but if this word has justification which during the war was perhaps the most used word in the field and at home, it has the most justification in regard to the interest swindle. But what about the war bonds? With the first five billion the Reich took out of the pockets of the people savings that actually existed. The money flowed back again. Then came the new loan to suck up the money again, and with that the last residual savings. And again came the pump, and sucked up the billions, and again they ebbed back again, until merrily, after this charming game was repeated nine times, the Reich had incurred one hundred billion in debt. In exchange, the people, of course, held in their hands one billion in finely printed paper. At first we imagined that we had become so much richer. But then comes the state and says, I am facing bankruptcy. Yes, but why? I myself certainly cannot go bankrupt, even if I occasionally take a hundred mark note from the right upper pocket and put it into the left. Certainly it would be the biggest folly of all if we 
continued the folly of our war bond economy by declaring bankruptcy. Uh, let us break the enslavement to interest on money. Let us declare the war bond certificates to be legal tender with interest canceled, and the nightmare of state bankruptcy will melt away from us like March snow under the sun. People say to me, the cancellation of interest payments is a disguised state bankruptcy. No, that is not true. The specter of state bankruptcy is really only a fairy tale and a boogeyman invented by the Mammonists' forces. The book by Franz Rohr was Jeder vom Stadtbankerat Weissen Mufi, what everyone ought to know about state bankruptcy, is completely stuck in Mammonism's ways of thinking, although the author in general quite clearly recognizes the economic problems that threaten us through social, social, socialization, and although he advises emphatically and correctly that in the end only a rebuilding of our economy can save us, he cannot free himself from this superstitious belief in the sanctity of interest, and therefore he depicts state bankruptcy entirely in accord with the interest of mammonism as a completely terrifying catastrophe. It is interesting to observe that Rohr, in spite of better historical knowledge, cannot free himself from the mammonistic view, and knows in his closing and notes in his closing word. If the ruinous economic catastrophe is not averted, no one will be spared by it. While on page 81 he admits that the consequences of public financial mismanagement have been partially reversed very quickly. And on page 68 he says that in any case there should be no doubt that Russia in the last century overcame these currency crises without lasting problems. On page 76 he says, while examining the effects of state bankruptcies, that although, of course, profound economic problems and so forth have occurred, by and large, neither the destruction of the state nor of its economic strength resulted. On the contrary, a rapid revival of the national economy and a recovery of public finances have been observed often enough. With the, when the author then continues for three more lines, saying that State bankruptcy absolutely means economic catastrophe and causes infinite misery. I regret being unable to follow his logic. But back to our particular case. Which would be more honest, to speak pharisaically of the unassailability of war bonds while oppressing the people with an egregious tax burden? Or... If a finance minister had the courage to approach the people openly and to declare, I cannot make the interest payments on the war bonds, or I can only if I collect exactly the same amount in taxes from you. But back then, during the war, I absolutely needed money. Nothing more clever see, in occurred to me, and so I did the swindle with the high-interest war bonds." You must forgive me, beloved folk. It was ultimately all for you, but if we wish to play hide and seek but we wish to but if we wish to play hide and seek no more, I, the state, shall pay no more interest, and you, the taxpayers, need not pay taxes to cover these interest payments. That thoroughly simplifies our transactions. We avoid the enormous tax bureaucracy and likewise the enormous interest paying bureaucracy thus conserving an immense quantity of money and work potential. I have lingered long on exposing this swindle, but I consider it absolutely fundamental here at no point to lose sight of the big picture. According to Bavarian tax returns, the circle of people that would suffer let us say precisely those that, according to their tax returns, received over 300,000 marks in interest payments, are 822 people, which is only 0.4% of those obliged to pay taxes in all Germany, therefore approximately 10,000. 
let us clearly for ourselves now as briefly as possible the mo clarify the most important aspects of this revolutionary demand. And indeed, let us consider the questions first from our national perspective. For this, there is first need of a clear look at our current situation. Secretary of State Eugen Schieffer, in his big speech in the Berlin Chamber of Commerce, has declared it impossible to ignore that it is only partly correct. Possible to ignore is the enor enormous indebtedness of our national economy and the unprecedented devaluation of our currency. In short, the fact that we have become an impoverished people overnight. The burdens that are being imposed on us through the peace treaty, however, cannot be ignored. The currently existing certificates of indebtedness, as we have seen, amount to around $250 billion. Let us assume first that the Entente imposes on us an additional $50 billion in war reparations in some form, and makes a total of around $300 billion in debt. However, heavily it may strain the narrow confines of this treatise, nothing Nonetheless, some words must be said about the magnitude of German national wealth. The investigations of Helferich and Steinmann Bucher assess the German national wealth at about 350 billion. One can only attribute very limited value to such findings, however, carefully they may have been derived. They are valid only for times of undisturbed economic activity. But they are also quite misleading, since state and municipal properties are included, thus, for example, also road repairs, waterway modifications, and so on. It is clear that although the production of such works may have cost enormous money, nonetheless they have, strictly speaking, no intrinsic value. A better yardstick for national wealth is so-called taxable wealth, as it emerges from the tax returns for the defense contribution or the wartime wealth tax. For this, a sum total of 192 billion results, thus much less by far than Hefferlich's figure. To this sum, nonetheless, about 10% may be added, according to experience, for the legally tax-free small fortunes and about an equal amount of silent reserves. Silent reserves are the result of underestimating positive values and overestimating negative values in accounting so as to create the appearance of the lowest possible net worth. In any case, it seems to me overly optimistic to speak of a national wealth of more than $250 billion. But even this number has only a very limited importance. The most correct thing would be to break away entirely from the idea of a national wealth that is all numerically graspable, and to penetrate to the recognition that national wealth finds its expression exclusively in the mental and physical work potential of the entire nation, and thus belongs to orders of magnitude that have no relation to the narrower concept of capital. Indeed, we must still see, still see a further source of national wealth in the presence of mineral resources, the riches of the forest, the fertile soil. But these things also cannot be grasped numerically, since their value fluctuates between zero and infinity, some depending on whether the mineral resources lie unexploited or based on a geological report, can be reckoned for billions of tons of coal and so on. Let us not forget that Germany really is a poor country. If, monopolies, if of monopolies it possesses almost none. In wealth of mineral resources it stands far behind most of its neighbors, to say nothing of the unparalleled mineral resources of the Chinese, Indian, and American empires. In fertility of the soil it falls far short compared to the blessed fields of Russia's black soil, and compared to the effortlessly productive stretches of tropical and subtropical land. Therefore, in the end, we have always only the potential and will of our people to work 
as well as the availability of sufficient work, and we must understand clearly that in this state of affairs there can be no talk of secured debts of collateral for our debt instruments. Whether interest-bearing war bonds or non-interest-bearing Reich banknotes, behind them stands only and solely the tax potential of the entire people. And what is tax potential other than a function of the work power of the total working population? We must now clarify for ourselves yet another relevant complex of questions, and of course the chief entries of our state revenues, sources, and expenditures. There is a remarkable contrast between the broad space that the concern for money-making occupies in our private lives and the attention that we give to the great questions of our state financial management, and yet between individual economy and national economy, no essential difference exists whatsoever. The chief entries for state revenue are, first, the net profits of the post offices and railroads, second, those of mines, forestry administrations, and other state enterprises, third, tolls and indirect taxes, fourth, direct taxes. So as not to foster purely theoretical discussions in such eminently practical questions, I want to elucidate the individual entries from the Bavarian State Budget of the year 1911 according to their order of magnitude. Post, telegraph, and railroads brought 120 million forests, mines, and so forth, around 40 million. Indirect taxes, 53 million. Direct taxes, 60 million. An additional 67 million flowed from stamp duties, fees, inheritance taxes, land taxes, revenue transfers from the Reich, and so on. What about expenditures? We find here in the first place the payments for interest on the state debt, including railroad debts, with 85 million. For the Royal House, 5 million. The Administration of Justice, 27 million. Internal Administration, 40 million. Churches and Schools, 51 million. Financial Administration, 13 million. Expenditures for Reich related purposes, 50 million. Pensions, 36 million. Miscellaneous expenditures, 5 million. Back then, in this fortunate year of Bavarian finances, the annual budget left a revenue surplus of 27 million. In the scope of our thought, however, only those expenditures concern us that can be omitted through the abolition of interest slavery. Here, the interest payment on the state debt naturally stands in first place at 85 million marks. Add to that the greater part of our payment for financial administration at about 10 million. Furthermore, a large part of the payments for Reich-related purposes of which let us add half, 25 million. And finally, the 5 million in payments for the Royal House are now gone, a total of 125 million. The disappearance of these entries means the possibility of renouncing imposition of all direct and indirect taxes, which, as we saw, brought in 53 million and 60 million marks, a total of 113 million marks. We are now not at all of the opinion that one should entirely abolish direct and indirect taxes. Unquestionably, within reasonable limits, they serve on one hand to educate, on the other hand to regulate. It is certainly not more than right and fair that the profits from property owned free and clear remain subject to a modern graduated tax, since the state, of course, must also maintain secure ownership with its policing agencies. It seems just as advisable that trade and industry be required to make tax contributions corresponding to their working profits, since the state also has to care for the maintenance and development of public paths of commerce. For them, cor corresponding minimum poll tax for every citizen entitled to vote is likewise a requirement of fairness, since care for the security of the person and his property is also required from the state. 
In the area of indirect taxes, a strong expansion of all pure luxury taxes has a regulatory effect in the best sense, while all simple food steps, stuffs and necessaries of the people should be kept free of taxes. The result of such a tax policy would be found less in high revenues, about which there can be no talk, since for the great mass of the population, taxation should be not a real burden, but only a reminder that the person is not only an individual essence, but also a citizen of the state, and that in addition to civil rights, he also has civil duties. Tax revenues should be less necessary for paying off the debts of state-owned businesses, whose net profits, as we have seen, suffice to cover the normal expenditures of the state for schools, universities, administration of justice, internal administration, and so forth. The tax revenues should be used to advance special cultural tasks of the state for which adequate resources were never available in the scope of the normal state budget. Here I am thinking primarily about orphanages, institutes for the blind and the crippled, daycare centers, care for expectant mothers, the battles against tuberculosis, alcohol, and venereal disease, and the construction of garden cities and settlements, especially for the accommodation and humane care of our war disabled. Our view broadens. We see virgin land. Could the abolition of interest slavery mean the cancellation of all taxes? It would mean that if we had come out of this gigantic struggle as a victorious people. As things are, let us not celebrate too early. The burdens imposed on us by our enemies will make sure that we do not. But in any case, we see virgin land based on the indeed quite simple example of our Bavarian state budget that we just used. In general, we find quite similar relationships in the other German federal states, and it is not too much to say that from the surpluses of the state-owned businesses, the railroads, post offices, telegraphs, forests, mines, and so on, all state expenditures for the entire administration of justice, for all internal administration, including state construction projects, all outlays for schools and universities, just as for cultural purposes, could be covered without difficulty. Thus a perfectly ideal condition. Why is that not the case? Interest has crept in. Because of the payment of interest, the population's foodstuffs become expensive. Because of interest, sugar and salt, beer and wine, matchsticks and tobacco, and countless other necessities of daily need carry indirect taxes. Because of interest, direct taxes must be raised, which are divided into land taxes that are passed on in the form of higher prices for grain, house taxes that drive up rent, business taxes that burden productive labor, income taxes that unavoidably depress the living standards of civil servants and people on fixed salaries. And finally, at the very end, modest in giving but insatiable in taking, Loan capital pays taxes on capital dividends. According to the tax returns of the year 1911, out of 253 million in capital dividends received in Bavaria, all of 8.1 billion was paid in state taxes. We have seen that all capital dividends, all interest on capital, ultimately must be raised through the labor of the entire people. We have seen that the interest payment on public debts constitutes the largest entry in our state budget, and we have seen that those obliged to pay taxes on interest payments make only an extremely limited contribution to state revenues. In terms of relative magnitude, the capitalist paid 8 million out of a total of 60 million in direct taxes, which is only an eighth to a sixth of the direct taxes paid in Bavaria in 1911. Direct taxes, however, are only about a fifth of the total state revenue. Therefore, loan capital contributes only about a thirtieth to a forty-eighth share of the state's total needs. It should not be denied that tax legislation during the war, especially in the last years, resorted to a stronger tax on capital dividends, 
but stronger indirect taxation has more or less kept pace with it, so that the relative size has hardly changed. The picture becomes dire when we consider the budget of the Reich. Here the proportions in themselves are already much less favorable. The Reich does not have the same tax sources as the individual federal states. Direct taxes are reserved to the federal states. The enterprises of the Reich are limited to the Reich's post office and railroad. Note that this does not include the Prussian state railroads. And consequently, only tolls and indirect taxes remain. The orders of magnitude of the Reich's revenue sources see Statistische Jahrbuch für das Deutsche Reich for the years 1917 and 18, were in the year 1915 1 billion in indirect taxes, 0.8 billion in special revenues, war contribution, matricular fees, and so on. Here, too, the same picture again. More than a third, 1.3 billion to be specific, was devoured already in the year 1915 by payment of interest on the Reich's debt. Here, too, loan capital pushed its way in again. Here, too, it requires all direct taxes to satisfy it. Sugar pays 163 million, salt 61 million, beer 128 million, tobacco, schnapps, sparkling wine, fuel lamp, matches, playing cards, and countless other items had to be taxed in order to scrape together a billion marks that then flows completely into the pockets of the capitalists. Today, how to pay interest on the Reich's debt is a riddle. Interest payments alone devour $8 billion annually, based on $100 billion in war bonds, plus other war credits. Revenues from the post office and railroad can hardly be further increased. A further increase in tolls will hardly be tolerated. Therefore, probably only a five- or tenfold increase in indirect taxes is left. An impossibility or the clear insight that only and solely the abolition of enslavement to interest on money can bring us salvation. An enormous self-deception is what the entire war bond economy was. The German nation borrowed a hundred billion from itself for its war. For that it promised five billion in interest to itself. It must therefore pay five billion in taxes. All benefit goes to the big capitalist, who draws so much in capital dividends that he cannot possibly use it up, and yet only a quite modest percentage is taken away through the tax on capital dividends, as we have seen. I hope now, through the main thrusts of my presentation already, to have dispelled the humanely comprehensible terror that many readers may have of eventually losing the interest income from their pretty certificates. Let it just be demonstrated very briefly with one example that the whole interest economy is a big self-deception and along with that I want to look at an upper level of solid middle-class income. Assume that the head of a household has an income from labor of 10,000 marks, and on top of that another 5,000 marks from capital dividends. In the first place, about 1,500 marks of this will be paid in direct taxes, then at least 1,000 to 1,200 marks in the form of high rents will be stripped away for eternal interest. Another 1,000 marks are likely to be drained off in the form of indirect taxes for a family of five or six, and already now one realizes that not much is left of the lovely capital dividends that the small and middle-sized capitalists enjoyed under the happy tax rates of earlier years. Indeed, already today there can be no more talk of surplus. On the contrary, if one examines for oneself Today, the current fantastic tax proposals, considerably more income from labor will probably be taxed away. Naturally, the situation seems to be quite different for the big capitalist, who, let us say, for example, collects only one million in capital dividends. Such people are fairly numerous in Germany today. On the tax on capital dividends, this fortunate man pays at the most 50 to 60 thousand marks. Of indirect taxes, he also pays no more than the family father of the previous example. 
on his budget after he can still live quite comfortably indeed with 40 to 50,000 marks, even in the current expensive era. If roughly a nice 900,000 marks cash remains to him, for that, with 5% interest on loans, he will get another 45,000 marks in the next year, and that, by law, at the expense of the working population. The small pensioner who only lives on his interest undoubtedly would be harmed. He is able to work, then he must of course resolve to earn an income from labor. With that, he then situates himself very much better than the millions of his folk comrades who have nothing other than their physical or mental work potential. If he does not want that, then he must eat into his wealth. Ultimately, he has twenty years to nibble at it again and again. If he continues to consume the annual sum that he has been receiving at five percent interest. For the, person that <coughs> for the persons that are not in a position to work or are weakened by illness or age, obviously an appropriate livelihood must be arranged through the development of social welfare for all segments of the population. I visualize social welfare as follows. Let us assume that an older lady, a widow, or who hitherto had to live on the interest from a capital investment of 60,000 marks, is, through the legally proclaimed abolition of interest slavery, deprived of her source of income. Here, through the broadest expansion of the pension system, opportunity would be given the aforementioned person to draw a pension corresponding to her capital, wherewith the annual pension could even be increased relative to the previous interest yield, so as to give a certain compensation for the diminished value of money even to this circle of people. Thus, for example, in exchange for the surrendered 60,000 marks in debt instruments of the Reich of the States, or in covered bonds, an annual lifelong pension of 4,000 marks could be given. If the widow has children and she wants to will a portion of the wealth to them, then it can be allowed to her that only 40,000 marks be transformed into a pension, while the remaining 20,000 would be kept for the children. Out of the 40,000 marks, depending on the age of the pension applicant, up to one-twelfth of the received capital could be given annually. Furthermore, let it also be noted here that with the discontinuation of oppressive taxes as a result of the abolition of interest slavery, the widow's cost of living will be quite considerably decreased. It would greatly exceed the scope of this essay to examine in detail the personal interests of each stratum of the population. Such a revolutionary demand cannot be about personal interests. Nevertheless, as the idea takes effect, one will find that the healthful consequences personally benefit every individual in the end. Precisely by the problem already isolated above, of how to achieve release from interest on war bonds, have tried to make it clear already that small capitalists, by which I mean all the hundreds of thousands that have been induced through a hyper-American advertising campaign to devote their savings for subscription to war bonds, not only receive no benefit from interest, since of course they must pay for it themselves with taxes, but with tax legislation tailored for the protection of big capital, must support interest payments for million mark subscriptions. It seems to me that apart from these immediate considerations, an appeal to all for the sake of their children's well-being must in itself persuade the anxious bondholder to accept as completely natural the renunciation of eternal interest from the Reich's debts. In this case, what does the patriot, who has given 10,000 marks to his fatherland in direst need, really lose, other than a usurious claim to draw 50,000 marks in interest within a hundred years, without even diminishing the principal? Eternally, his children and grandchildren must work 
just to pay all the interest. The question of repayment of the lent sums can be solved in various ways. In my briefly stated main idea about the problem at hand, which I submitted to the government of the People's State of Bavaria, under Kurt Eisner on 20 November of last year, 1918, I proposed simply to have repayment take the place of interest payment at the rate of 5% annually for 20 years. I believe that in what follows I can even make a much better suggestion, which, because of its simplicity, certainly deserves preference. The war bond certificates upon cancellation of interest will be declared to be currency. That is the egg of Columbus. The advantage of this measure is, in the first place, that nobody really feels anything from it. The war bond certificates continue to lie at rest in the depots, but no young people get them, any more than a book or a cabinet or some otherwise useful object that somebody would lend to his friend. If one needs money, then one simply whips out a war bond note and pays with that. War bond notes have, after all, just as much beauty and paper value as our other ten, twenty, hundred, and thousand mark notes. There can certainly be no talk of the markets being flooded with currency in such a bump-free transition from the interest economy into the interest-free national economy. All the world war bond certificates are indeed already well protected and stored in bank vaults or other places of concealment considered secure by the people, such as a woolen stocking or a manure heap. Indeed, it cannot be denied that our issued paper currency, as much as about 40 billion, is also not in circulation, but for the most part is hoarded in the manner described above. Our need for currency in the times of economic boom before the war was only about four to six billion, and it is inconceivable that we would need more than twice that much today in the ever more customary cashless economy. The cancellation of interest is to be done in precisely the same manner for all interest fixed interest assets. For these assets, just as for dividend-yielding assets, the originally proposed repayment in 20 or 25-year annual pensions is recommended, especially for mortgages. The abolition of interest slavery for mortgages means, without a doubt, the solution of the housing problem, the liberation from exorbitant rents. It is not at all evident why the holder of a mortgage should have the eternal benefit of interest from a sum lent once, why an effortless and endless influx of goods should be granted to him, why the great mass of a people, only for this unhealthy principle of interest, should pay high rents year in, year out. Let it be interjected very briefly that self-evidently there can be no talk of a complete cancellation of rent, since, of course, the management and upkeep of houses demands constant labor and money. A lowering of rents thus can only occur so far as it results of its own accord through the accomplished repayment of mortgages. Only one thing should be sharply emphasized, that the abolition of enslavement to interest has not the slightest thing to do with our total value-producing labor, insofar as no hindrance is posed in any way to the entrepreneurial spirit, to productive labor, to the manufacture of goods, to the acquisition of wealth. On the contrary, as we have seen, the entire working folk is liberated from a stifling, unreasonable, heavy burden. Our soul life is purged of an intoxicating poison. We can tell how correctly the fruitlessness of the interest problem has been recognized in the course of history by the fact that minds in all ages and all peoples have been occupied with it. In various pages of the Old Testament, such as Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 15, we find regulations about the cessation of interest in the form that, uh, that the seventh year should always be the acceptation or jubilee, in which all debts for of folk comrades should be abated. Solon 
in the year 549 B.C., abolished personal debt slavery through legislation. This law was called the Great Shishatsia, taking off of burdens. In ancient Rome, the Lex Gamicia of the year 30, 32 B.C. abruptly forbade Roman citizens entirely from charging any interest. Under Justinian, a prohibition on compound interest was enacted with the regulation that no more interest whatsoever should be demanded when overdue interest has accumulated to the level of the sum originally lent. Pope Leo I, the Great, decreed in the year 443 a general prohibition on taking interest. Until then, only clerics had been prohibited from demanding interest on a loan. The ban on interest was now part of canon law, and also a binding regulation for the laity. Secular legislation also gradually fell in line with canonic views and even threatened punishment for charging interest. We find this in the police ordinances of the Holy Roman Empire for the years 1500, 1530, and 1577. Of course, such laws were now much opposed and frequently circumvented, and in this quite sure short historical retrospective it may only be mentioned as an astonishing historical fact that although under the canon law of the 11th and to 17th centuries the charging of interest was forbidden to Christians, it was permitted to Jews. It would be extraordinarily charming to investigate each instance what economic tumors led to these powerful shedding burdens. It would be especially valuable to see which powers and forces have violated the prohibitions on interest again and again. In the Middle Ages, certainly short work was often made of usurers. The farmers or citizens, having been bled dry, got together and beat the profiteers to death. Today, we have entered into a completely different phase of the interest problem. Such pogroms are most deeply disapproved. Also, it is no longer a matter of individual, locally confined, confined symptoms of illness that could be combated by excising the pus pocket, which is happening in a, a, a serious sickening of all humanity. It should be most emphatically stressed that precisely our contemporary culture, precisely the internationality of economic relations, makes the interest principle so murderous. The foregoing historical retrospectives should also not be regarded as providing an analogy for the circumstances of today. When the Babylonians overcame the Assyrians, the Romans, the Carthaginians, the Germans, the Romans, then there was no continuation of enslavement to interest. There was no international world powers. The wars were also not financed through borrowing, but with treasures accumulated during peace. David Hume gives a very nice overview of this in his Essay on Public Credit. Only the modern age, with its continuity of ownership and its international law, allows loan capital to escalate into infinity. The penny that was invested at interest at the time of the birth of Christ exists no more, because since then all rights of ownership have had to give way to violence several times. By contrast, the penny that old Rothschild invested at interest still exists and will exist if there is international law for all eternity. In addition, it should be considered that broad stretches of the earth have only in the modern age gone over from natural economy to money economy. It is quite especially important in this connection that only in the middle of the 19th century were all restrictions on charging interest and likewise all prohibitions on interest abolished. Thus, England in the year 1854, Denmark 1856, Belgium 1865, Austria 1868. Thus, today's concept of interest as inseparable from the possession of money 
is not much older than half a century. But precisely this interest concept has for the first time caused money to turn into the demonic power of such universal coercion that we have come to know. The incipient and then ever-increasing indebtedness of states to capitalists likewise dates only to the middle of the 19th century. Only since that time do we see the state degraded from being the trustee of the folk community into being the trustee of capitalistic interests. This development has reached its highest, its high point in war bonds, which we encounter in all lands, which exclusively, as we have recognized, serve only mammonistic interests, which should be crowned with the gigantic credit edifice of a world loan. These brief retrospectives should make it easier for us to find, finally break away from the supposition that onto loan capital must be lent the supermundane power to grow eternally and interminably from itself. Gifted with a terrifying potential for sucking dry, we must break away from the notion that loan capital, unaffected by worldly deeds and misdeeds, should be able to sit enthroned above the clouds, unaffected by transitoriness, unaffected by the forces of destruction, unaffected by the shots of our giant guns. For should even houses and huts, railroads and bridges shattered by shells sink into dust and ash, the mortgages will still exist. The railroad bonds and public certificates of indebtedness are not thereby erased. Should villages and cities, entire provinces, fall victim to the insane destruction of war? What is the result? New certificates of indebtedness are what it means. With eyes flashing, greed, the gold international, enthroned above the clouds, watches the mad rush of humanity. And not long distant is the time when all humanity finally shall serve only as interest slaves to mammonism. The idea is international. It must liberate the entire world. Hail to the nation that first dares the bold step. Soon others will follow. The question often directed to me whether the idea is nationally realizable at all, I answer with yes. We are internally indebted. Against foreign interest claims, we are naturally powerless for now. These must simply be paid. Excessive capital outflow must be blocked to the extent possible. But as little as the lawgiver retrains from working, outlaws against murder, manslaughter, fraud, and so forth, because there would still always be scoundrels, just as little should a people in its totally, totality restrain itself from making a step recognized as necessary for the healing of public finances, just because of the fact that not exactly the best elements of the folk are trying to carry their loot in, into safety outside the country. If we assume that hundreds of millions, even billions in war bond certificates would be spent abroad, even this could still not be a significant impetus for failing to abolish interest slavery. For proportionally, of the more than 250 billion marks in fixed interest domestic investment assets, by far the majority must still be in the country. Let us again summarize briefly. The abolition of enslavement to interest is the radical means for the final and permanent healing of our public finances. The abolition of the interest community means the possibility of renouncing oppressive direct and indirect taxes because the state-owned businesses, especially after the socialization of further suitable sectors, inland navigation, electricity, air traffic, and so forth, will give sufficient surpluses to the public coffers to support all social and cultural tasks of the state. Aside from this financial consideration, the abolition of the interest community will grant to productive labor in all fields of endeavor the priority that it deserves. Money is returned, once again, to the role appropriate to it, to be a servant in the powerful drive of our national economy. 
It will become again what it is, a voucher for completed labor, and wherewith the path is cleared for a higher goal, for abstention from the raging money-lust of our age. The idea points toward the establishment of a united front of the entire working population, from the unpropertied laborer, who, as we have seen, is very heavily burdened with indirect taxes for the satisfaction of loan capital, through the entire bourgeois class of civil servants and employees, of the farming and small trades middle class, which get to feel the pitiless tyranny of money in the form of wretched housing, farmland rental, bank interest, and so on, all the way up to the leading heads, inventors, and directors of our big industry, who are one and all more or less stuck together in the claws of big loan capital, for whom the first task of life is always to work for the sake of pensions, dividends, interest, for the money powers playing behind the scenes. No less do all circles of the intelligentsia, artists, writers, actors, scholars, as well as other independent professionals also belong to this group. Although big loan capital, as a group of natural persons, or as the personification of the interest principle, seeks consciously or instinctively to conceal the fact of its boundless lust for control, and although our entire legal tradition, based upon Roman law, thus upon law serving for the protection of a plutocracy, has ever so strongly emphasized the protection of property and therewith permeated our people's sense of justice, the abolition of enslavement to interest on money must come as the only way out of the threatening economic enslavement of the entire world by the Gold International, as one of the ways to drive out the poison of mammonism with its corruption and contamination of the mentality of our age. The Conversion of War Bonds into Bank Credit We demanded above for the conversion of war bond certificates and so forth into legal tender as on numerous occasions been met with the objection that it would mean excessively flooding the market with currency. This objection is in itself quite erroneous. Inflation occurs through the mere existence of war bond. It is, however, true that in spite of its wrong-headedness, the concern about the physical presence of these papers declared to be currency is not going away, and therefore must, despite being unrealistic, this concern might generate unfortunate side effects, as if in fact a new inflation had taken place. Therefore, amending the above, we demand, after legislative cancellation of the obligation to pay interest, Conversion of war bond certificates, along with other public debenture bonds, not into currency, but into bank credit. This formation has the great advantage that the physical existence of war bonds as paper would cease. The war bond certificates would be delivered to the Reichsbank by banks, bankers, thrift institutions, and so forth, and would be destroyed after a credit note for the face value is issued. Therewith, nearly every person in Germany would receive a bank credit, an open bank account that he could use. In other words, the bonds are cashed, like putting currency in a bank, and you get a checking account. Such a procedure would also have the great advantage that the retention of larger investments in private possession would not be possible since after the expiration of a specified deadline the undelivered certificates would be declared void. Furthermore, it would at least be possible to control how much war bond is spent outside the country, thus affecting Germany's trade balance. The last point, however, must not in any way block fulfillment of the abolition of enslavement to interest. Since we really feel too weak compared to foreign countries, we must satisfy only the interest demands that confront us from abroad. Personally, I am entirely of the opinion that we should also uphold the cancellation of interest even for foreign bondholders. We need not fear that foreign interest claims would be enforced by force of arms, since there has been so much progress in returning 
from war madness to something resembling self-awareness. And never yet in history has a warlike action been undertaken against a great state because of financial measures affecting private persons. It also ought not to be imagined that even the French people would issue an ultimatum to Germany because of the interest claims of Messrs. Mayer, Schulz, and Kohn from Germany based on their German war bonds carried across the border. Beyond this, it would be possible, so as to avoid even the appearance to the rest of the world of a state bankruptcy, to conduct a lottery of war bond, which then, of course, could easily be rigged based on statistics obtained through the required delivery of certificates, so that at first just the numbers presumably belonging to people abroad would be drawn and paid off in Reich banknotes. Yet a third thing would be the welcomed ascertainment of the distribution of war bonds and the accompanying opportunity that exists for an extraordinarily simple collection of the wealth tax, while the bursaries, of course, would need only to instruct the Reichsbank offices to charge the account of Monsieur N. N. with so and so, Monsieur such and such with so and so many marks of in tax. In this manner, tax pay payments would be more painless by far although, of course, the taxpayer's right of appeal would continue to exist in its full extent. With such a transformation or conversion of war bonds into state credits, a certain social leveling could also be accomplished, insofar as smaller investments in war bonds. Thus all small subscriptions of all those for whom the subscription of war bonds really is to be accounted a patriotic deed. Let us say up to five or ten thousand marks would be made good at par, while all larger subscriptions could be credited at a rate to be established. The credits for all other government paper would be handled precisely the same. Special Comments on the Demand for Law in the Manifesto It is completely indispensable that all state and municipal debt subscriptions be treated in the same way, since only such a unitary large-scale regulation of our entire monetary system, hand-in-hand -hand with the abolition of interest slavery, can be implemented. It is already clear that the abolition of interest slavery must be applied simultaneously to all the other fixed interest papers so as not to cause an absurd boom in these papers which obviously would occur if the public papers alone were declared interest free the reduction of the debt as such would be accomplished through annual repayment whereby a constant and consistent on debting of all debt laden objects would be accomplished this paragraph is very closely related to the preceding ones, as well as with the demand for nationalization of mortgage lending. The farmer or homeowner burdened with mortgages continues after as before to pay the amount that he had to pay to his creditors, but no longer as eternal interest, rather as repayment. Thus, after 20, 25, or 30 years, depending on the pre-existing interest rate, Ownership of land and home will be freed from debt. The mortgage bank, for its part, can naturally likewise on only during this time continue correspondingly to pay interest on covered bonds to covered bondholders. Hand in hand with this liberation from debt arises the community's right of ownership in the real estate freed from mortgages. A universal registry of dwellings, or rather a real estate cadaster, would have to come first, because debt-free real estate ownership naturally also has the right to repayment of invested capital, and also a permanent claim on a portion of the rent, to pay all the charges, expenses, and so on that come with real estate ownership, as well as appropriate compensation for work that the owner himself does. Let us consider this in broad outlines with the example of an urban apartment house. The house has a value of 100,000 marks. 
Against that is recorded a mortgage bank's investment of 50,000 marks at 4%. In a position... In, in position one, a non-corporate investment of 20,000 marks at 5%. In position two, and, and 30,000 marks is the amount put up by the householder himself. The revenues from rent are 7,000 marks. From this must be paid 2,000 marks for the first mortgage, 1,000 marks for the second mortgage, and 1,000 marks for expenses, outlays, and so on. In all, 4,000 marks. Thus, 3,000 marks remain to the house proprietor as an interest payment, so to speak, so for his own invested capital of 30,000 marks. Following the implementation of the legal abolition of interest on money, the situation after 10 years is as follows. First mortgage, 30,000 marks. Second mortgage, 10,000 marks. The house owner has completely recovered his capital investment, but on the other hand, there is a new public right of ownership in the amount of 50,000 marks. With that, the right of the state to have a say about further income from rent and to determine the amount of rent begins. It would be unjust now in regard to repayment to put the house proprietor on the same level as mortgages. For his capital is not pure loan capital in the narrower sense that should be affected by the abolition of interest slavery. Here we are talking about risk capital, specifically about money converted into a valuable good, specifically a house. It is therefore up to the owner of the house whether to grant a longer duration of payments or a corresponding percentage permanently included in the housing expenses of the house. It cannot be the purpose here to make any binding proposals. Here only suggestions are being made as to how a frictionless transition of the interest economy into the interest-free economy could occur even in the area of real estate. So as to complete the example, let the status after 25 years be presumed as follows. By that time all mortgages are paid off. Only the permanent expenses are the same or because of the greater age of the house increased from 1,000 marks to perhaps 1,500 marks. Let the return afforded to the house proprietor from this sum also be about 1,000 to 1,500 marks. Thus, accordingly, it appears that around 3,000 marks of the rent revenues go to cover non-negotiable charges, while the remaining 4,000 of the original 7,000 in rent revenues would be freely disposable. The state thus has the possibility of lowering the rents by more than half. It would do this, for example, in workers' dwellings, or the state may cut rents by only 20, 30, or 40 percent, and thus gain from the difference an enormous source of revenue for the other public necessities, above all, naturally, for publicly conducted home construction. For mansions, the rents are not lowered or not lowered much, whence very great additional means become available also for the better construction of homes or for special social purposes. This future state of affairs, however, reveals, and I hold this for a very fruitful prospect, the inner justification for the community or state even now to take part in determining the amount of rent in the manner that I sketched above with a lowering of rent for workers' dwellings. In the growing right of state to participate in real estate ownership also lies the foundation for a sound bank of issue, an issue of credit to mortgage creditors. These paragraphs demand the socialization of the entire monetary system. Money is only and exclusively a voucher for completed labor issued by a community that has its own state. To issue money tokens is one of the sovereign fundamental rights of the state. The counterfeiting of the state's money tokens is subject to the most severe punishments. Thus it is quite forceful social demand that the monetary system be placed under the control of the collectivity. The work power of the collectivity is the sole substrate of the 
the money tokens. And only the failure to appreciate this fundamental fact has led in general to the deterioration of our public finances and to complete anarchy of the monetary system in general. With the surrender of personal and commercial credit by private bankers proposed above, a deeper incision is made into the total credit system. For the state credit system, as well as for the municipal and even real estate credit, one must cleave to the abolition of interest slavery with utmost rigor and energy because it is the indispensable prerequisite of the social state in general. The situation is different with personal credit. We also demand in and for itself the interestlessness of personal credit. Yet this demand does not carry the same enormous and principal importance. We remember the $250 billion in fixed interest loan capital compared to the only $12 billion in dividend-paying stocks. All such credits, stocks, participation certificates, mining shares, equity holdings, and so on, are risk capital. The yield of this capital depends on the industry and efficiency of those persons to whom the money was entrusted. Here the element of risk and danger of loss thus comes into play, along with the question of personal trust. For that, a certain compensation of a special kind still appears indispensable. The owner of stocks and so on is in no way compensated or benefited if the enterprise to which he entrusted his money earns nothing. He loses his money entirely if the enterprise collapses. It is otherwise, for example, the owner of a of debenture bonds of the Reichseisen Bahn. The Reichs Railroad are completely lost with the loss of Elsa B. Lothringen. Nonetheless, the holder of railroad bonds continues to receive his interest payments. From whom? From the taxes of the collectivity. The railroads may work with a deficit balance of any magnitude, as in Prussia and Bavaria in the last year, yet the bondholders receive their interest payments just the same. From whom? From tribute paid out of the work potential and consumption of the working population. One would just like to make this fundamental distinction perfectly clear in order finally to recognize where it is that the vampire sucks from the work potential of the people. Thus, personal credit should remain, or rather be allocated again, to personal dealing through the private bank. The personal efficiency of the credit seeker with which the banker is personally familiar should again become the determining factor for personal credit. The fees set by the state will regulate themselves by themselves in accord with the fluidity of money that will in any case commence with the abolition of interest slavery. The main point of Section 5 is also valid for dividend assets in particular. In the interest of the social state community, it must be demanded that a repayment of the capital once lent be attempted also for the great industrial enterprises, in order to bring about here too a reduction of the indebtedness of the individual industrial works towards those that are only investors. For in fact, what we were able to observe in the relationship of loan capital toward all peoples repeats itself here on a smaller scale. Here, too, the capitalist exploits the worker, the foreman, the engineer, the entrepreneur, all equally because the compulsion to have to earn dividends takes priority. If, however, we attain the liberation of industries and industries and businesses from the eternal interest sucker, then the way is clear for the lowering of prices of products for the delivery and distribution of surplus value, partly to the community, partly to laborers, middle management, and boards of directors of the particular enterprises, thus to those that really alone create manufacturing and values. In this paragraph, naturally the entire field of insurance also comes into play. 
which can be constructed on an analogous interest-free basis. The premiums paid cannot grow through addition of interest. Rather, the insurance companies will become thrift institutions. In other words, the risk and advantage of insurance are retained. For this, the political community has to be responsible. With regard to the devaluation of our money, which has resulted only through the enormous mass of our innumerable certificates of indebtedness, we demand a strongly graduated wealth tax. We lay the emphasis on this, strongly graduated. A flat wealth tax for the purpose of reduction of the number of notes and so forth would be nothing but a self-deception whereby one throws sand into the eyes of the people. For if I also confiscate half of all the wealth everywhere and receive payment in bond and pulp these, all that is really accomplished thereby is a diminution of the amount of paper, while in return a conversion factor will increase the fictive value of the totality of circulating paper to some level as before. Real value belongs always only to goods for consumption and goods for use, never to paper vouchers for completed labor. Another question is whether the foreign exchange rate of our mark currency can be improved. But even this improvement of the exchange rate is again in the final analysis only dependent on work potential and production. In other words, the possibility for production of our total national economy. The Objections and Their Refutation Never yet has an idea been able to establish itself without opposition. Least of all an idea that makes such a radical departure from the long-established assumptions about the sanctity and inviolability of interest. With the objections already raised and those expected here, uh, and those expected, there is always a twofold observation to be made. It must be asked first, what part of the objections being made is based on deliberate distortion of the idea of abolition of interest slavery? And second, what ought to be said in response to all sincere and fact-based misgivings? The most frequent objection is the assertion, without the charging of interest, nobody will lend money. We do not, in fact, want anyone to lend his money anymore. Credit was the trick, was the trap into which our economy entered, and in which it is now helplessly ensnared. If the folk really urgently needs greater capital, then it gets the needed monies interest-free at the central state treasury with only repayment required. Eventually it will issue new banknotes. Why should it issue interest-bearing certificates? Whether the paper bears interest or not makes no difference. Its only and sole backing is the work potential and tax potential of the folk. Why burden every public expenditure from the beginning with the leaden weight of eternal interest? Yes, but how should the state fulfill its cultural labors for the community? It still needs money and can be fair in this task only by way of loans that charge interest. This assertion is based on an entirely mammonistic way of thinking. It would have to be deliberately calculated for misdirection after thorough reading of this manifesto. For in the first place, we have proven that after the abolition of interest slavery, all cultural and social tasks of the state can be covered out of state-owned businesses, out of the revenues of the postal service, railroad, mines, forests, and so on, without anything further. In the second place, the sovereign people's state Volkstadt has the power at any time to take care of special cultural tasks through the issue of interest-free value tokens in lieu 
of the interest-bearing certificates declared to be the rule of the mammonistic state. It is thoroughly impossible to see why the state should make special cultural tasks, railroad, canal, and hydroelectric construction more costly for itself with an eternal promise of interest that is completely unnecessary. If it can pay the costs of construction from the revenues of its current state-owned businesses, then there is no reason to see why the state should not create the money. The sovereign people must indeed pay for it while it recognizes precisely this money as a means of payment. Why, however, should the folk and its entire work and tax potential stand behind another slip of paper, the interest-bearing loan, which imposes on the folk in its totality only an eternal interest obligation for the benefit of the capitalist. Therefore, away with this obsession of the mammonistic state. The capitalist then will just take up the issued paper notes and accumulate paper money. Uh, another objection. The capitalist will then just take up the issued paper notes and accumulate paper money. This is refuted in two ways. First, the demand that mere possession of money should be rendered unprofitable would then, of course, be already fulfilled, and the abolition of interest slavery voluntarily undertaken by the capitalists themselves, since the capitalist renounces interest of his own accord if he piles up his paper notes at home. Second, the capitalist's fear for his money makes it unlikely one need only imagine the sleepless nights of the currency holder who keeps great sums of money piled up at home and must constantly see his possession threatened by thieves, robbers, burglars, house searches, fires, and floods. I am convinced that the upright citizen would become tired of these worries in a short time and would soon find his way to the state bank. The state bank issues a receipt and is now legally responsible for the account, but not for any interest payments. Otherwise, of course, a third possibility still remains open to everyone, specifically to work with his money, to create values, and to manufacture goods, to participate in industrial undertakings, to render his life ever richer and finer, to support art and scholarship. In short, to make beneficial use of his money while rejecting the cult of mammonism. It can, however, still happen that private need of capital for some goals urgently present themselves, for example, for testing of inventions, founding of businesses by young competent craftsmen or businessmen, and so forth. To begin with, this has nothing whatsoever to do with the abolition of interest slavery, for in the first place one must logically assume that the capitalist, who after the abolition of interest slavery, of course, has no more opportunity to invest his monies in a bomb-proof manner and to expect idle consumption of interest, will rather, as in the earlier age, be inclined to risk his money for such purposes, so that a lack or need in this direction will therefore occur much less than hitherto. Or has one not heard, on the contrary, again and again, from the efficient business people, from the cleverest inventors, precisely the complaint of how difficult it is to get money in the mammonistic state for such purposes unless a dividend could be guaranteed. In the second place it must be the task of the coming state to foster every competent force through generous support. There were indeed even before now already beginnings toward this in the old bureaucratic state but so small-hearted that instead of a stimulus, an inhibition and reluctance resulted. Because of the harassing regulations that accompanied the granting of public support. In the third place, let it be noted that with the allocation of several million marks, enormously much could be achieved. The joy of labor, the industriousness and tenacity of the German inventor, engineer, craftsman, and so forth, is so great that through the state's right of participation in the results of fortunate inventions, the expenditures most likely would be richly rewarded. England as an example. Another objection. The abolition of interest slavery leads necessarily to the exhaustion of wealth. Oh ho! Who claims that? 
But of course, whoever has adopted his life to the consumption of his interest payments on capital and cannot resolve to work with him, it is certainly true. Consuming 5% annually, he will have completely exhausted his wealth in 20 years. Of course, but what is... But that is indeed completely in order. What we want is precisely the abolition of interest slavery. We want living on a pension to cease being the citizen's highest ideal. We want to end this mammonistic decadence. Indeed, we want no longer to tolerate that one, that many, that tolerate that one, that many can live in comfort permanently. Only from interest payments and loans, in other words, at the expense of others. I repeat, it is not true that at all the abolition of the lordship of interest would lead to the elimination and exhaustion of wealth. On the contrary, the abolition of interest slavery would promote the creation of wealth based on labor that, is, that manufactures goods and produces value, unburdened and liberated from eternal interest outlays. The abolition of interest slavery leads, as we have seen, to a comprehensive lowering of costs in all life. It unburdens us from the excessive weight of taxation, so that for every working man the possibility of accumulating savings must be greater in the future than hitherto. One more thing. The goods and values producing national economic labor of industry, commerce, and trade is in no way hindered but fostered to the utmost through the abolition of interest slavery. What does the worker get if capitalists receive no more interest payments? This question really ought not to be coming up any more. In the first place, of course, it was the constant battle cry of labor that the capitalists would exploit the workers. In the second place, we have indeed clearly and plainly seen that it is the laborer more than anyone else that is required to pay the interest on loans. The bonds of family are weakened and damaged if one can leave no wealth behind for the children. Yes, what is the reality here? Quite generally, I think that money has little or nothing to do with the sense of family. Or has one heard that the children of wealthier parents cleave to their parents more than those of poor parents? Or do rich parents love their children more than the less propertied? What is likely to be more important for the what is likely to be more important for the children that their parents arrange for them the best possible upbringing and have them learn some discipline raising them into industrious and healthy and courageous people or that they leave behind for them the biggest possible money bag in particular cases a justified striving to secure the children's financial future undoubtedly will have to be acknowledged. This striving, and thus the thriftiness of the parents for their children, will be in no way adversely affected by the abolition of interest slavery. On the contrary, the possibility of saving will become greater. When our national economy will be liberated from all-encompassing pressure of interest slavery. We have seen from the example of the man with earnings of 10,000 marks and pension income of 5,000 marks, that all medium-sized and small fortunes are in fact robbed of any beneficial effect by the circuitous route of the direct and indirect taxes of housing rent and so on. I cannot repeat often enough, interest on bonds for possessors of small and medium amounts of wealth is a swindle, a self-deception, a running around in circles, but big capital through its devoted press has quite diabolically propagated and proclaimed all to, in all the world the faith in the sanctity and inviolability of interest. It allows everyone seemingly to take part in the lovely anesthetizing consumption of interest in order to lull to sleep the bad conscience that must invariably accompany idle, laborless consumption of interest and in order to recruit comrades for the struggle for the defense of this highest good of mammonism. The civil servant, the statesman, will say, The state cannot renounce the obligation that it has undertaken towards its creditors.
What does obligations mean? Is it in any way moral to enter into obligations about which the state must know from the beginning that it can only fulfill these obligations if it takes the interest away from the creditors through direct and indirect taxes in precisely the same amount? Where is the morality in that? Or is it not perhaps more honest to admit, I can only pay the interest if I collect just as much in taxes. But back during the war I absolutely had to have money, and for that I did the swindle with the war bond. You have to forgive me, beloved folk. It was ultimately for you, and now we want to play no more hide-and-seek. I, the state, am paying no interest to you. The taxpayer need not pay taxes for the interest that will substantially simplify our transactions. Thus we shall do without the enormous tax bureaucracy and likewise the extraordinary interest-serving bureaucracy, right? Do we have a deal? And you, Herr Shudderman, do not again post your name on every advertising pillar as the Secretary of State of the old compromised government amid foolish declarations relating to the security and inviolability of the war bond. You only embarrass yourself. The benefit of the entire swindle has indeed gone only and solely to big loan capital. Financial officials and banking professionals are declaring that the abolition of enslavement to interest on war bonds and public debts is impossible because it is synonymous with public bankruptcy. You will forgive me. According to your speeches, we are indeed publicly bankrupt anyway, or must become so. An overt declaration of public bankruptcy, however, would be the greatest stupidity that we could commit. To the actual incompetence of the current power holders, it would add prematurely the historical confirmation of this incompetence. Why declare bankruptcy? If I have put three marks from the right pants pocket into the left, I must not on that account declare bankruptcy of the right pants pocket. It was indeed no different with the war loan. The Reich took out of the people's pockets the first actually present billions. Then the money flowed back again. Then came the new loan, and again the money streamed back. Once again came the pump and sucked the billions again. They ebbed back, until, after the game has been repeated nine times, the state had merrily generated one hundred billion in debt. For that, the people had one billion in finely printed paper in their hands. At first the folk imagined that that had become so much they, that it had become so much richer. Then came the state and said, It is horrible, I have one hundred billion in debt and face bankruptcy. Yes, but why? That is, in any case, only a self-deception. I myself can indeed never become bankrupt if ever so often I take my money from the one pocket and place it in the other. Therefore, we can rest at ease about state bankruptcy in regard to our internal war debts. Therefore, we really need not declare public bankruptcy, and we can really spare ourselves the gigantic labor with the stupid interest payments and the big but even stupider taxes. Let us indeed finally free ourselves from doing the bidding of big loan capital. Only big loan capital benefits from this loan interest tax swindle since a lovelier lump of gold is left over for it and the laboring folks pay this surplus in the form of indirect taxes. Meanwhile, however, the small and middle-sized capitalist simply chases his own tail. The, gov the global economic official says, the abolition of interest slavery is not possible for us to accomplish in Germany alone. It must be done internationally. Otherwise, we shall lose all credit. Capital will flow away, and we will still have to fulfill our interest obligations toward the rest of the world. I confess that I myself was at a loss about this question for the longest time. 
It is the most difficult question because it involves our relationship with the rest of the world. Meanwhile, the matter has two sides. On the one hand, the idea of the abolition of interest slavery is the battle cry of all productive peoples against international enslavement to interest on money. On the other hand, it is the radical cure of our internal financial woe. But it is really no reason to refrain from using a cure just because the equally sick neighbor does not employ it at the same time. It would, however, be added stupidity if we in Germany continue to run in a crazy circle and pay taxes and interest when we have clearly recognized that this ridiculous activity benefits only big capitalists and nobody else. Therefore, let us lead the way by our liberating example. Let us liberate ourselves from the enslavement to interest on money, and we shall soon see that the force of this victorious, liberating idea will stimulate the peoples of the world to follow us. I am actually convinced that our initiative, if this initiative is not suppressed by German mammonists, will sweep the other peoples along with irresistible necessity. The Spartacist says, The whole idea only amounts to a protection of capital. It still remains then as it was. The poor man has nothing and the rich remain. Yes, my friend, it is in general very hard to have a discussion with you. If you really are in the depths of your soul a communist and will therefore actually maintain that all things belong to all men. And if along with that you are indeed familiar with the actual ideas of the great Bolshevik leaders in Russia, especially Lenin, and regard them as correct and accordingly regard the next tasks of the Soviet Republic designated by Lenin, universal tendering of accounts and control of all production and distribution as humanly possible. If, however, you are completely clear about the fact that this task is really only feasible, if at all, under a horrible tyranny, and you still remain at the bottom of your heart a convinced communist or Spartacist and so on, then let us not dispute further with each other. We just do not understand each other and are speaking different languages, and the future will decide either for the straitjacket state that can ultimately result from the chaos of Bolshevism or the new state, for which I hope with the national economy liberated from interest slavery. But if at bottom of your communist heart, if you are honest, you find that you think about still long for wife and child for a human soul that stands closer to you than an Eskimo or a Zulu kafir, if, during factory labor commanded by the Soviet director, you think that it would still be nice to possess your own little cottage, a little garden plot, if indeed the very depth of your soul it would really give you no true satisfaction that you should be entitled like a dog on the street to use every bitch that crosses your path, if you want to call somebody your wife, if you merely think about saving something from your wage, which then should belong to you alone. Then you are already no longer a communist. Then you have already in your heart broken from your so loudly proclaimed catchphrase, all things belong to all men. Then precisely what you do not want is that all things should belong to all men who want that precisely what you wish for yourself, wife, child, house, farm, savings, whether you already have it or only hope to get it, even then should belong to you alone. And do you see, my friend, if you only suspect in your heart that it might make a difference to you, if some random individual came and simply took your savings away from you in the name of all, and if he brought another child for you to look with him and, and, and took with him yours, because all children belong to all, then, my friend, let us not continue to speak completely past each other. Perhaps I could ask you to contemplate whether, in fact, the communist message that all things should belong to all men would not necessarily mean the end of every culture, 
because the lack of any concept of ownership must, with compelling logic, force man down to the level of the beast. If all things belong to all men, if a tendering of accounts and control of all above-ground production and distribution in Lenin's sense could be coerced, then, in the best-case scenario, an ant colony would result. But, if that, but in that case, we can also do without language, soul, thought. Mutely and instinctively, we can perform our forced labor. The end of man is there. But enough now, friend Spartacus. Let this fundamental consideration seek, seek, sink deeply into your head and heart. A more exact answer to your question will then result during conversation with other parties. And now, you comrades of the two socialist orientations, moderate and independent, I cannot imagine that serious contradiction or objections against the abolition of interest slavery would come from your side, and yet I must deal with your cat you categorically, along with the entire socialist world of ideas, from Marx up to the current leaders, Ebert, Scheidermann, Kautsky, and so forth. First, the socialist will. Elevation of the working class is an idea unconditionally bound to prevail. So far, we are in agreement. Second, the paths trodden for the attainment of this great goal are almost entirely wrong because they, three, are based on false assumptions. Four, the Marxist socialist idea of the state leads necessarily to communism, thus to decline. Fifth, because, however, social democracy has a different goal, the elevation of the working class, of all working people in general, it faces a terrible inner conflict because the logical consequences of Marxism lead to the direct opposite of the practical goal of the workers' movement. Sixth, from this inner division results the overt uncertainty of the direction of government. Seventh, for the sake of the great practical goal, elevation of the working class, a sharper line must be drawn against Spartacus and Bolshevik communism, and their methods must be combated with all might. But social democracy, organized through labor unions, feels weak today before these radical groups because it has taken up Marxist thinking as its fundamental principle of education and because all Marxist ways of thinking logically lead to communism. Now the proof, point two, says that the paths trodden by social democracy are almost entirely wrong. The whole, the whole agitation conducted throughout the country has led to a deep division within the population of our nation. The constantly repeated slanders against employers of every kind, indeed of every bourgeois, calling whatsoever, as exploiters and bloodsuckers of the manual labor working ostensibly unassisted, have led to an unjustified embitterment and to the haughtiness of labor which today necessarily finds its expression in the demand for the dictatorship of the proletariat, the essential demand of the Erfurt program, the transfer of the means of production from private ownership to the ownership and operation of the community has today been compressed into the cry for socialization. It is completely clear to every serious politician that full socialization of our economic ruin would mean complete state bankruptcy. But one dare not confess this openly and freely to the people. Not socialization, but de-socialization would have to be the motto now. Thus, one attempts to compensate the blatant miscarriage of every social socialization through delusional tax projects and by this route to expropriate the expropriators for the second time. All of that means nothing other than abandoning the entire national economy to utter ruin. Instead of growth, a double of production as the entire socialist literature of the period after the revolution promised is out of the question. The exact opposite has occurred. 
The worst thing, however, would be if the current socialist government thought of accepting big foreign loans. With that, not only would our economic decline be sealed, but we would furthermore quite entirely deliver ourselves into interest slavery to the Entente, from which there is would be no return. The fundamental failure, the basic error, upon which this whole wrong chain of treaties, demands, and promises to the people has been constructed, is an entirely wrong attitude toward industrial capital and loan capital. The Communist Manifesto, the Erfurt Program, Marx, Engels, LaSalle, Kotsky, have not recognized the radical difference between industrial capital and loan capital. On this point, the entire social democracy must relearn. This fundamental error must be clearly recognized and frankly admitted without reservation. Then, however, must, one must also relentlessly draw the only possible conclusions. These, however, signify radical renunciation of the pointless because completely mistaken, rage against industry, against the employer. Worker and work-giver belong together. They have the same goal, work, production. For without production, without work, there can be no life, no culture, no forward, and no upward. The self-evident and unavoidable oppositions that exist among humans just because they are humans, are much less important than the great shared interest of employer and employee. These oppositions are and have been resolvable by means of wage contracts and trade organizations to the mutual satisfaction of both sides. But let us not pursue further these questions that are trivial in the scope of our treatise on the largest political lines of force. Let us only emphasize that the interest of labor collectively is perfectly aligned with our national industry, with the national economy of our people. Whoever teaches otherwise and presents the oppositions between employer and employee as more important reveals himself as irresponsible precisely in regard to the workers, for he thereby lays the axe to the roots of the tree that nourishes and supports the worker. Social democracy, however, has done that and with that it has incurred eternal guilt before German labor. With that it has brought unspeakable misery upon our folk, because it cannot keep all its promises, because it cannot bring to us the peace of mutual understanding, because it cannot create work for us, because it must even set up an armed force against us, because it cannot get by without the civil service, because it must demand the obligation to work, because universal, equal, and direct suffrage for men and women over the age of 20 helps nobody to earn a living because without the state's guarantee of the security of person and property, chaotic circumstances must occur, because without integration and subordination of the individual into society, no vitality of the state is possible. Thus a deep despair-filled wave of disappointment passes through the entire people. If individuals still do not understand it, ministers, members of parliament, and people's delegates continue cheerfully lying to each other that the gains of the revolution must be defended against reaction. What these two terms mean, if anything, no sincere statesman would be able to tell the people clearly. The negative actions of the revolution, the deposing of a series of antiquated dynasties, disposing of officers, abolition of the nobility, dissolution of the army, in short, the great demolition is indeed no gain. And the reaction. The swept away rotten doctrine of divine right does not have anywhere in the entire folk enough moral support to result in any forceful action. The bourgeoisie as regards the real bourgeois, bourgeois is much too cowardly, much too morally corrupt to rally against class-conscious labor. Therefore, it is not necessary for the ruling class of the workers to be worried about a dynastic or bourgeois reaction. But the deep disappointment of the people about the so-called gains of the revolution, in other words, about the lack of any real improvement of the people's situation, that is the great danger. This disappointment leads to the streaming away of great masses even farther to the left, 
where the promises already made are outbid by far. Ultimately, one can no longer make promises such as all things to all men. That is pure madness, but every idea, every phenomenon, every activity stretched and exaggerated to the extreme becomes madness in the end, and then changes into its opposite. So goes it likewise with the communist idea that all should belong to all, for this ultimately comes to an end and resolves, its, uh, into, it resolves into all, having nothing, hunger, despair, misery, sickness, and need. Arrived in Russia, people have lost the last remnant of courage and joy of living. I repeat, the enormous fundamental error in the socialist idea world is ultimately to be traced back to the failure to recognize the deep essential difference between industrial capital and loan capital. Interest-devouring loan capital is the scourge of humanity. It is the eternal, effortless, and endless growth of big loan capital, not productive goods manufacturing, industrial working capital, that leads to the exploitation of peoples. I cannot forego here the examination of the question of why this essential difference has not been recognized, whether it really has not been recognized, or whether it perhaps has been obscured for the benefit of big loan capital, whether the leaders and chiefs in the struggle against capitalism, whether the authors of the Communist Manifesto and the Erfurt Program <clears throat> and the current leaders always have proceeded with the necessary conscientiousness. It is a most grave and terrible thing when one casts doubt on the absolute earnestness and firm conviction of another. It seems all the more grave the more carefully one seeks after the causes and relationships pertaining to life's occurrences. I want, therefore, also to give no answer at all to this question itself, rather only to allude to big, obscure connections by citing an utterance of Disraeli, the greatest English Prime Minister, Lord Beaconsfield. This he writes in his novel Endymion. No man will treat with indifference the principle of race. It is the key of history, and why history is often so confused, is that it has been written by men who were ignorant of this principle and all the knowledge it involves. Baron Sergius to Endymion. The bourgeois. The bourgeois to whom rest appears as his bourgeois duty is certainly disturbed by every new revolutionary demand, as always with every new idea. It means unrest for him, or perhaps he would even have to think something about it. All change is odious to him. He wants to have his rest, and woe to him that covets his money bag. Now, indeed, one does want from him his interest payments, his income from rent on houses, the interest payments from his covered bonds, the interest that he collects on mortgages, in short, what constitutes his rest, his contentment, and his good fortune. Even so, we must inquire what the members of the classes owning loan capital will have to say. They form apart from the true bourgeois. Bourgeois is a human type with which nothing further is to be initiated. The bourgeois is a branch on the tree of humanity that should be lopped off, the sooner the better. These are the smug, self-satisfied babbits with their deplorably narrow horizons, who are capable of no enthusiasm. They while away their days in eternal monotony with coffee, morning newspaper, morning drink, noon paper, lunch, afternoon nap, coupon clipping, afternoon drink, friends at the pub, and occasionally the movie house. Lacking comprehension for all that moves the world, for all which youth longs, all that distresses the folk, the state, and society, untroubled about war and victory, they vegetate and decay simultaneously 
arrogant and obsequious. But the bourgeoisie is such a broad class that it cannot be ignored. Thus, through the abolition of interest slavery, thrift is destroyed. People end up in the poorhouse. That the abolition of interest slavery quite genuine, generally may have its influence on thrift must be decisively denied. Thrift has just as little to do with the prevailing economic views as, for example, wastefulness. Thrift and wastefulness are human qualities that either are present or not, indifferent to whether an age approves or frowns upon the idea of interest. In times of transition, perhaps an increase or diminution of thrift can be promoted. In the given case, however, I tend much more to the view that a rational, economically balanced person will say to himself the following. I can no longer in the future count on living on my interest alone. I want, however, to live in later years and also still leave something behind for my children. Therefore, I must now save more. The abolition of interest slavery must, in my opinion, exert this effect on the majority of people. As for the elderly, of course, they will be referred to public support. Here, too, I must once again stress emphatically that given the current burden of direct taxes on property and the burden of indirect taxes on every lifestyle, nothing of the lovely interest payments remains except in the case of that person for whom, and it is indeed something iniquitous and to be combated, all income flows only from eternal interest payments. Therefore, a decline in thrift is probably not to be feared. Is big capital really so utterly unfruitful? Has it not also created the means of large-scale pro progress that bears fruits for humanity greater than what the interest on loan capital destroys? No! The posing of the question only proves that mammonistic phraseology has clouded our clear vision. Big capital has not created the means to large-scale progress. Rather, big capital has grown from labor. All capital is accumulated labor. Big capital is in itself unproductive because plain money by itself is thoroughly unfruitful thing. From mind, labor, and available or already developed raw materials or mineral resources, values are produced and goods are manufactured through labor and only through labor. If one pours so much money onto the most fertile farmland, into the richest coal mine, the farmland does not on that account bear grain, nor the coal mine spit out coals by itself. Let us conclusively affirm this. If people have invented money, it is according quite useful and reasonable, for in every complex economy one needs this universally recognized voucher for completed labor. But that a potential should inhere in these money empires to grow eternally from themselves into enormity, and money does that, if it can bear interest, it is that against which the core of our being rebels. It is that which exacts money far above all other earthly manifestations. It is that which makes money into an idol. And all of that is indeed only the most enormous self-deception -de of humanity. Nothing, nothing at all can come from money alone. Table, cabinet, clothing, house, tool, in short, everything around us has some value. In the end, one can still use a broken piece of furniture as firewood to warm oneself. But with a twenty-mark note, one cannot do anything. I cannot even wrap a piece of cheese in it. Only after people have sensibly agreed on the facilitation of exchange of goods for consumption, to write vouchers for completed labor, only with that does the slip of paper receive meaning and purpose, and it is very reasonable that the farmer, for his grain, receives from the coal-mining company not coal, 
but money, thus a voucher for other completed labor, for example, pitchforks, crockery, plow, and scythe. But with that, the power of money should end. Thus the large-scale progress of humanity has been made not by money, but by the men themselves, their bold spirit, their proud daring, their clever mind, the strength of their hands, their shared, therefore, social industrious labor. So proudly and so clearly must we see. The men were the thing, certainly not the pitiful pieces of paper that men invented for the simplification of commerce. Further program. Although the abolition of interest slavery is not the final goal of the new statecraft, it is truly the most incisive deed, the only deed that is able to unite all peoples to a true league of nations against the tyranny of mammonism that encompasses all peoples. But it is not the end. On the contrary, the abolition of interest slavery must lead to further steps because, as we have seen, it lays hold of the global evil by the root and, indeed, by the main root. Only when the ground-laying demand for abolition of interest slavery is fulfilled is the path cleared for the first time ever for the social state. This must be clearly recognized. It must be accomplished in spite of all mammonistic powers. The cry for socialization is nothing more than the attempt to bring about the formation of a trust of all industries and to create giant conglomerates everywhere over which big loan capital, in spite of all wealth taxes, will naturally also have the deciding influence again in the future. A socialistic state on a mammonistic foundation is an absurdity and leads by nature to a compromise between social democracy already strongly contaminated with man mammonism and big capital. We, by contrast, demand radical rejection of the mammonistic state and a reconstruction of the state according to the true spirit of socialism in which the ruling basic idea is the obligation to nourish in which an old, basic demand of communism can find its rational and useful satisfaction, in the form that every member of the folk shall receive his assigned entitlement to the soil of the homeland through the state's allocation of the most important foodstuffs. We further demand, as a skeleton for the new state, a representation of the people through the Chamber of Representatives, which is to be elected, on the broadest basis, and next to that, a permanent chamber of labor, the central council in which the nation's workers have a voice in proportion to their distribution by profession and economic class. Finally, we demand the highest accountability of the directors of the state. This new construction of the state on a socialist aristocratic basis will be treated in an additional work that will appear soon from the same publisher. The prerequisite for all this construction, however, remains the abolition of interest slavery. My unshakable belief, nay, more, my knowledge, makes me recognize clearly that the abolition of interest slavery is not only enforceable, but will and must be taken up everywhere with indescribable jubilation. For bear in mind, in contrast to all the ideas and movements and endeavors, however well-intentioned, that aim at the improvement of mankind, my proposal does not want to try to improve human nature. Rather, it applies itself against a toxic substance, against a phenomenon that was artfully, no, diabolically invented, completely contrary to the deepest feeling of man in order to make humanity ill in order to ensnare humanity in materialism, in order to rob from it the best thing that it has, the soul. Hand in hand next to it goes the frightful, pitiless tyranny of the money powers, for which people are only interest slaves, exist only to work for the dividend, for interest. Deeply troubled, we recognize the fright with the frightful clarity and truth 
of the old biblical Proverbs according to which the God of the Jews, Yahweh, promised to his chosen people, I want to grant to you to own all treasures of the world. At your feet shall lie all peoples of the earth. You shall rule over them. This global question is now laid out before all of you. Global questions are not solved with a wave of the hand, but the idea is clear as day. And the deed must be diligently propagated. We must understand clearly that we face the most formidable enemy, the world-encompassing money powers, all force on the other side, on our side only justice, the eternal justice of productive labor. Extend your hands to me, working people of all countries. Unite.